I think people can hear me, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> no one's accused me of being too soft or subtle. Um, to, welcome to the Tuesday evening, August 16th, 2022 Curriculum Committee of the Radnor Township School Board. We have been on hiatus for the last month, so uh, just for the month of July, so we're looking forward to a robust discussion and uh, plenty of information. we got a busy meeting ahead, so um, I think we'll start with public remark, or I'm sorry, administrative remarks. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the start of another school year in RTSD. Uh, today we have a jam-packed agenda, but there are a couple of points that I'd like to highlight before we do jump into uh, our meeting. First, uh, each year we take the opportunity at the August Curriculum Committee meeting to highlight the student handbooks. Uh, these handbooks are posted on the RTSD website for parents and students to review. Our handbooks help set expectations for the orderly operations of our schools. Parents and students are asked each year to review these prior to the start of the school year. Uh, I do have a link for those people watching the curriculum committee uh, currently under administrative remarks that we do have all three handbooks listed. So if a, you are watching and interested, you can jump right in and, and dig into those. Uh, but those are, are also available uh, through each of the respective school websites. Second, uh, RTSD will be convening a calendar committee to take a deep dive into our instructional calendar. Uh, we'll be exploring district holidays, our first day of school for students, weather emergency days, and other items brought up by committee members. So if this is something that is up your alley, we'd encourage you to go ahead and check out this weekend's Radnor Reader and put your name in if you're interested in serving on the calendar committee. Uh, that is all for my administrative remarks this evening. Could, Great, thank you. Uh, could I just ask a follow-up on the um, handbooks? We used to ask that students and parents sign that. Is we, that st we still do that. So it's part of our online back-to-school portal. Uh, so uh, back when I was in school, they used to send home an enormous packet uh, of uh, forms for, for us to, to fill out as parents. Um, and now we've gone digital. I think this is like year four or five for us to go digital. So part of that is uh, them digitally signing off that they have read the, the student handbook. So that procedure will be the same and the students and parents know about that it. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Just given the assumption that not everybody spends their time watching Radnor Township mm -hmm. School District Curriculum Committee meetings and that some parents kind of race through that package. Is it possible to have a reminder in homeroom, at least at the high school level, maybe? So one of the things that they do every year at the high school is they have the first day of school, they have class meetings, and they go over any changes to the student handbook and expectations. And so they do hit home on things that, even though students, you might be a junior or senior, it's good to hear it at least once a year. So that is something we certainly build into every opening day for our students. Perfect. Thank you. I had the same question, Mrs. Solomon, so I appreciate you asking it. Um, we, I don't see any members of the public here this evening, so I guess my question is, do we have any emailed public comment? No. Okay. Um, I was asked to remind people, so anyone who's watching, that we do have an update to our policy on public comment, um, details of which will remind the public at our full board meeting, um, but that in the future you will have the opportunity, if you can't make it to a meeting, to contribute a comment, but it won't be by email, so you need to make sure that you plan and reach out to the administration and head in advance, and that'll all be uh, described in more detail in the meeting. Thanks. Uh, so I guess next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. I didn't see anything of concern. Did anybody else have any? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we'll approve those. Um, and then the we're gonna move on to our agenda. So. Mr. Bechtold? Yes, yeah, so our first agenda item is the MTSFS implementation update, and Dr. Dukevich is going to provide this update. Thank you, Mr. Bechtold, and I'm going to invite Dr. Kearney uh, to the table there to join me. Uh, Dr. Kearney and I uh, work very closely with the implementation of MTSS. We make up our administrative core team uh, here at the building. We work with uh, a lot of other constituents and uh, the building-based teams to continue things forward. Uh, it is my hope that in the very near future, we're no longer presenting MTSS updates because it just becomes part of our systematic approach to meeting the needs of all learners. Um, however, we're not quite there yet. Um, this update represents really our second year of practical imp implementation. Uh, in, in actuality, it's probably more like year three, and even before that, we had a lot of work and PD that led up to the first year of implementation. So this presentation is really meant to capture where we are going into this year 
Also, there's a number of contracts uh, for the board to consider uh, for our agenda and how all those contracts fit into one cohesive piece and why they're very important too as we move into the next school year as part of our implementation of MTSS. Before I jump into the agenda on slide two, I did want to thank uh, the, the numerous amount of administrative team members. We had a number of committees that included a wide array of folks from teachers to coaches, again, administrators, who helped us get to the point where we are today, which is a recommendation for a number of new initiatives. Uh, without their work, without piloting programs, we wouldn't be at this point now. So I want to thank them. All right, so our slide, uh, our agenda here tonight. There are essentially four items we're going to discuss. One, just an update on where we are with MTSS this year uh, overall and also by level. So elementary, middle, and high school. Wh what are we doing this year specifically to those areas? Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, these new data protocols and practices that we implemented this year, as well as a couple new products that we're going to be introducing uh, as part of the MTSS process. We're going to talk through that, as well as a very exciting data warehouse and in intervention tool called LinkIt. Uh, that we'd like to add as well that will help tie everything together um, in that process. All right, so moving on to the next slide. A number of these slides you've seen in some form or another, so I'm not going to read, obviously, the, the content specifically, but really more where this represents where we have come, where we're going, and you'll notice that that implementation plan list begins to become shorter because those practices and systems become more habitual and part of the process. Uh, as you look back to the last two years, you can see what we've done. This year, really at the district level, we're looking at uh, really looking at our tier two, our tier three supports, really refining those practices, making sure that they are meeting the needs of, of all students, uh, really diving into our common, valid, and reliable diagnostic assessments, and that's really the balance of some of the, the tools you're going to hear about in this presentation, refining our, our schedule and our practices to make sure that they align well in a vertical uh, format as well. And then at the classroom level, continue to focus on core instruction in Tier 1, specifically in mathematics. It's going to be a big focus for us this year. And uh, really looking at those Tier 2 interventions and what are those, uh, the pieces that really help to support those students beyond that core time. Uh, the next slide really kind of captures what we're doing at each level uh, with the MTSS implementation. You'll notice there are a lot of commonalities between the three levels. Uh, as you get to the granular, more towards the bottom of each list, you'll find that uh, all the buildings are in different places for different reasons. You know, you may have remembered last year, um, sometimes at the high school, middle school, and even elementary, we were exploring and investigating uh, certain things. This year, we're implementing, we're refining, and we're finalizing. So we've taken those adjectives and moved them forward. Uh, you'll see as the products we're going to talk about in, in the contracts that are on the agenda, they feed into a lot of these implementation components, uh, most notably analyzing data, making uh, decisions based on that data, and helping that uh, feed that system that we're putting in place. So building capacity with all those pieces is an important next step for us. I did want to highlight at the middle level, we're taking our second step social-emotional learning curriculum. Uh, we're going to span that now six to eight and that will be a full kindergarten through eighth grade social emotional learning curriculum. So the program will be from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. Uh, so the middle school is implementing that this year. They're also investigating positive behavior supports at the middle level and different components that may feed into uh, how the middle school uh, will work. At the high school, this uh, marks our second year of the consolidation of the academic level. Um, that's a, there's a lot of work that feeds into that alone. So the team at the high school is really working closely to make sure there's you know, plenty of support and differentiated practices there for, for that level uh, consolidation. They're also adding a lunch and learn component, which is an opportunity for students to, to gain access to supports uh, during two days in their cycle for one hour. And that gives, again, students opportunities to meet with their teacher, to do drop-in sessions in the writing and math centers, things like that. That's going to be a nice addition. And of course, the, the college and career readiness study that we heard so much about last spring, that's going to be initiated as well. So there's great things there that, again, all fall within the MTSS umbrella. So moving along, the next slide, uh, slide five. As we've implemented the last two years, we've re really recognized some areas, uh, I wouldn't call them necessarily weakness, but area that we know we could improve upon. So as part of the continuous improvement process, one, one significant takeaway really related to our data practices. How are we analyzing data? How are we accessing data? How are we equipping and supporting our teachers and using that data appropriately? So this slide here reflects four areas that we have kind of 
come away from in our implementation process. Uh, the first is we, we needed more assessment data that was timely, that it was easily accessible, and was actionable. That was an area that we, we recognized. Two, we, we needed more data that followed students over the short term and the long term, recognizing progress monitoring, summatives, formatives, and all those pieces together. We didn't feel like we had enough of a portfolio uh, in that realm. We also, the third, is we wanted data that could help us diagnose root cause. Why are students struggling in one area or another? Why are they excelling? What is the root cause? How can we either remediate or replicate uh, those types of things? Uh, and finally, we needed a tool that really could collect all these data pieces into one really practical way uh, and giving our coaches, our administrators, and our teachers ultimately access to that so that they can you know, inform their instruction on not just a long-term but a short-term process. So we recognize those four needs. The next several slides we're going to go through are what we deem to be our solutions to those needs. Uh, the first is, you know, before you start choosing products and choosing applications, you need to set a foundation for how are we utilizing data across the board? What are our universal practices? And so the first thing we did as a team administratively, and that's engaging our coaches, uh, was developing some data protocols. So how are we going to utilize data? What are our deliverables? How are we going to memorialize that data? How are we going to create actionable steps in a continuous improvement model? And we, what we did is we investigated a number of different things. We brought our administrative team together. We consulted with the CCIU, the Chester County Intermediate Unit, um, with a training on PVAS and eMetrics, which are our two you know, pretty well-known um, data sources that relate to Pennsylvania uh, state assessments, such as Keystone and PSSA. Uh, we also worked with our administrative team on developing a data template and process. And we utilized the IDC, which is a research-based um, third party, uh, and adopted their practices because they, they came about in a very approachable and practical way to doing um, systematic data analysis. So we set the foundation for data protocols and practices. That was the first thing that we wanted to do. So moving ahead, part of last year was we, we did a pilot on our internal, uh, and our internal diagnostic assessments. What do we already use? And then what other options are there, are there out there that may uh, be better for us, that may be more comprehensive and meet the needs that we, we were looking for? So last year, we piloted uh, STAR 360, which is an assessment very similar in many ways to the MAP assessment, which we've had at Radnor here for over a decade. Um, we, and a lot of folks will ask, well, why did you choose STAR? You know, MAP, MAP has a good reputation here and things like that. Uh, STAR is a growing, uh, very widely used assessment tool uh, across the nation. This slide just captures some of the uh, statistics that they publish. But it's, uh, it's been becoming more and more widely used because the value of STARS, you'll see in a couple subsequent slides here, is that it's less testing time for kids, which means more instructional time. The data and reporting aspects of the program are very uh, timely and actionable. We could administer it many more times than MAP. Uh, MAP had very fixed windows. We couldn't access data for a long time. So we were piloting STAR with a, um, we'll go to the next slide there, Mr. Bechtel, thank you. We uh, piloted STAR with 36 teachers in, in uh, classrooms in first grade through eighth grade. We had representatives from all, all buildings, all three elementaries in the middle level, uh, at all grades. And last year, what we did is we worked uh, through professional development to train those teachers in how to administer the STAR, and also a supplemental resource that accompanies STAR called Freckle. Uh, we had regular Zoom meetings with that team, that pilot team. We offered them PD. Uh, we did three teacher questionnaires to evaluate the tool and their use and their ease and all those things. We also offered optional meetings with other school districts who were currently utilizing STAR in different ways. Move on to the next slide there. Uh, at the same time, while our teachers were piloting and utilizing with their students, um, Dr. Kearney, myself, and our team continue to investigate what other districts are using STAR and what capacity they're using STAR, uh, what third-party, non-biased organizations have uh, done evaluations of both MAP and STAR and how those compare. Um, and also, we've, we met with representatives of both Renaissance, which publishes STAR, and NWA, which publishes MAP, to continue to investigate their data reporting. And again, what are some things that we, we could use more and what best aligns with what we were looking for? Um, in the end, on slide 10, uh, our full analysis and summary of the pilot resulted in uh, essentially STAR being uh, the superior product that our committee felt would best suit the needs that we had as a district and best suit the needs of our students. 
This summary chart here would reflect the assessment qualities along the left column. Those are the things that we looked critically at. And then what each assessment offered res respective of those assessment qualities. You'll notice at the bottom of that table, uh, the cost per year map comparative to STAR. Uh, you'll notice that STAR is just slightly above the cost of MAP, but again, for the qualities that it offers us as a district, we felt that that was, uh, that was worth, worth the additional cost. So moving forward, our plan for implementation of STAR is also a thoughtful and comprehensive um, transition. We met with our middle level uh, administrators and, and some of their, the folks there who deal directly with the data and administration of, of previously MAP and will soon to be STAR. And because the program of studies at the middle school is built on placement criteria affiliated directly with MAP, uh, that team felt that if we were to take this year and continue with MAP for just two grades, that way we would not be in any way deviating from previous placement criteria, uh, while at the same time uh, uh, fully administering and implementing STAR grades one to five and eight, that we would be moving forward with our, uh, the results of our pilot while also maintaining fidelity of our program of studies. In that same process this year, we will revise our placement criteria and our placement um, as it results to the program of studies uh, for grades six and seven, so that when we move to 23-24 school year, we'll fully transition to the STAR assessment uh, first grade through eighth grade. And that is our transition plan. Again, that's been um, the, the summation of a lot of work with, uh, with all of the committee members and the pilot team, middle school administration, uh, Mr. Bechtold and Dr. Kearney. All right, so I'm turning the page now. Uh, the next product to talk about is Acadians Math and Reading. This is a product that's not relatively uh, new. Acadians uh, Reading, for example, is the same as Dibbles, which we've been using as a product for a long time. The name has changed. So we've used Dibbles Reading, uh, which is now called Acadians Reading, for a long time with our students. We're going to be expanding that from the primary grades to f K to 5. Uh, we're going to use a reading component for progress monitoring K to 5. And then the addition, really, the expansion here is the addition of math progress monitoring, which we've had very little of um, in our program, at least in elementary. So we're going to expand Acadian's uh, reading third, fourth, and fifth, and we're, we're adding math uh, K to 5 to offer us a progress monitoring tool uh, with the acquisition of mathematics tool uh, skills. So you'll see a little bit of background here. Uh, it is a very widely used tool. Again, a lot of the districts we spoke with uh, regarding some of these other products are also adopting Acadians as well. Uh, so it was interesting. The next product is IXL Math Resource. So as part of our pilot last year with MTSS, we uh, were implementing STAR 360 with those 37 teachers. Alongside that is a supplemental resource called Freckle. Uh, Freckle, for those of you who have heard of Compass Learning before, which worked with MAP, Freckle is kind of the accompaniment to uh, STAR 360. So based on how students do on STAR 360, uh, the Freckle creates a personalized and individualized pathway to work on skills that those students need more practice with. We, we piloted that uh, first through eighth grade. At the end of our pilot, um, our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers, specifically in math, felt that Freckle was a little elementary for some of the middle level learners. And at the same time, we're piloting uh, IXL which actually is a resource that's been used in the district for some time now as a free resource. Uh, but it doesn't, the, the free resource offers you very narrowed um, um, aspects where the, uh, the paid resource obviously much more. Uh, so at the end of the pilot, the, the math teachers at the middle level uh, made the recommendation to adopt IXL instead of Freckle, uh, which still can work nicely with a star. So uh, that's another recommendation we're making as well, is to adopt IXL 6th, 7th, and 8th grade as a math supplemental resource. And finally, uh, that last data component that we recognize as an area of, of, um, of need for us was pulling all that data together into one place, being able to synthesize the data and act on it, um, help us uh, make groupings with students and really meet the needs at all levels. And uh, our team, again, the administrative team, mostly made of our Ed Council members and our coaches. We came together. We, we uh, organized three different sessions with three different uh, organizations to present to us products uh, at the end of that session. And actually, we did a very objective criteria. We used a rubric uh, to evaluate each of those products. We actually met with um, Lincoln specifically a second rotation and, and dove into data for another two hours with those uh, same individuals. And at the end of the day, we felt that Linkit would be uh, an excellent uh, answer to our data uh, deficits, if you will. 
So on the next couple slides, not to read this, but uh, Link it offers a lot of background on the, the type of work, uh, the type of uh, the dashboard and, and the different uh, system aspects that it offers to us. And there's a lot of questions that we've actually, <laughs> we've asked, uh, I know certain public members have asked, and Linkit uh, has a lot of opportunities to answer those questions in a really efficient way. So those are listed on the slides for the presentation, um, but not to belabor the point. It's, it's really what we found to be the most comprehensive data warehouse tool um, out there. Linkit is also uh, supported by the DCIU, the MCIU, and the CCIU as a recommended product for data analysis. So finally, if we go to 17, there we go. Our implementation of Linkit looks like this. Uh, this year, we're gonna continue to run what we still have, which is called Performance Tracker. Uh, Performance Tracker is a over 20-year-old product. It's been with us for a long time. It's part of PowerSchool ecosystem. It's what our, our teachers have used for a long time to enter uh, common assessment data into the system. And we feel like Linkit is a pretty significant shift. And for that reason, we wanna use Linkit for, first with our administrative team and our coaching team uh, to build capacity around uh, the use and the aspects of the features. Um, we will still use it with staff, but really the primary interface will be with our coaches and our administrators. Um, beyond this year, what we would do then is phase away from performance tracker completely and then uh, be fully invested and link it with even, our, even at the teacher level. We just haven't determined yet to what degree. Uh, but we feel like Linkit's gonna really answer a lot of questions. So wrapping back to uh, the data areas that we felt were needs, those four areas, uh, you know, we can move to the next slide as well. As well. This slide really represents how these products uh, are meant to answer those specific four things. So again, if we're looking at timely data that's um, accessible and actionable, STAR 360, Freckle, Acadians, and IXL offer aspects within their assessment suite to help us to get that type of data. Likewise, with data that follows students over time, both in the short and long term, those same products are able to, to achieve uh, that need as well. When you look at data that's um, diagnosable, that you can get to a root cause and, and help to determine instructional next steps, Star and Acadians do that for us. IXL and Freckle offer certain aspects, but they're more practice supplemental um, and more responsive to student benchmark and summatives. Um, but we feel like Star and Acadians can help to achieve that. And finally, as I just shared, Linkit is our answer to collect the collection, the organization, and the ability to synthesize data uh, so that our teams can really be the most effective. If we move to the last slide, the big question is, okay, well, what are the cost implications for these changes? So this slide is meant to represent uh, in the red columns, these are existing programs we've had and the costs associated with those programs. On the very left column, you'll see the, the school years that uh, we were in last year, our current approaching year, and the two subsequent years. The green columns represent the products that I just shared in the presentation and what we'd like to do to transition to those. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see the cost annually uh, beyond this year. One thing I wanted to point out, because some of these numbers you know, stand out a bit, uh, most notably the addition of Renaissance Star and Freckle. Uh, the contract noted in there is actually a three-year contract, so we pay it up front. The next two years, we would not have a, an annual fee there. Uh, we're also able to apply ESSER three funds, which was part of our board-approved process because we knew the pilot was going to come this way. Uh, and whether we would apply that to MAP or STAR, or whatever was the result, we, we had that planned out. And then um, if, if we were to remain with Performance Tracker and Assessment Builder, which we've had for many years, that is, a, again, a power school product. If we were just to upgrade to their current version, which actually was part of our analysis in those three products, we would have close to a $57,000 per year cost for those products, uh, where Linkit is, yes, slightly more than that, but our team, through that objective pra uh, practice, found that Linkit was the far superior product for us. So you'll find that in some cases, we could, um, we could choose a different product that might be slightly less, but again, our team felt that these products would best align with our needs and would provide us the most comprehensive uh, data analysis process uh, for, our, for our teams. So I did a lot of talking. Um, open it up for questions now, but again, I just want to, hopefully this reflects a lot of work last year that went into trying to answer some bit, pretty big questions around data and how it can inform MTSS going forward. Would you like to start, Mrs. Hallman? Yeah, I'll try to remember what all I had to ask and may have to come back. All right, so 
I'm not a fan of changing what we're doing because we've had a blip with COVID, you know, we haven't been able to get data, and now to change the one consistent assessment, I don't know. I mean, how are you going to um, look over time? You don't, you're not going to have the history of using this assessment, and we didn't have consistent data through COVID from PVAS and the state um, sources. So I don't know if this is the right, just that question, is this the right time to change yet our one consistent data source? And you're speaking about MAP. Yes. I mean, we, have, we still have yeah, PSSA's, yeah, Keystones, maps. and the other pieces. Um, and that's where I think our pilot team, which was, again, 37 educators who piloted with their students, felt that at the end of the day, STAR offered us much more. Um, that it, it, right now, MAP, historically, we, we've used pretty much for placement criteria. That's been the primary use of MAP here. Um, just speaking on a personal slash professional level, I spent nine years with MAP in a, in a district two times ago. We piloted MAP in my previous district for 18 months against STAR. STAR was far and away, I think it was 90 some percent, the chosen product uh, after 18 months of piloting both alongside each other. Um, many districts um, have chosen, even just around our area, uh, we looked at all the local districts that have moved to STAR, many of which had MAP and chose to move to STAR. Um, so they went through a very similar, probably, pilot process. I don't know, you know, the details of all those things, but um, there's a number of local, very large school districts that have recently moved, into, moved to STAR. And that's kind of how we're, you know, districts hear about it. Why did you do that? You know, and it offers us so much more. So in the, on the, under the umbrella of MTSS, we feel that STAR offers us uh, more than just a placement criteria data point. Um, as, as you saw on that chart, the comparative chart, it offers us a progress monitoring tool, a benchmark assessment, uh, that universal screening tool. And the length of time it takes to take a STAR assessment is about 25 minutes, where MAP is about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And yet they're both rated as reliable, valid, and unbiased by third-party um, analysis. So again, all those features culminating together, that's where our, our pilot team landed. So what assessments um, K through five are kids going to be required to take? They're going to be taking STAR 360 and their PSSAs, and that's really it for the standardized testing? Yes, those are the, the main standardized tests. Acadians is more of a progress monitoring tool. Literally, the math um, probe of it literally takes under five minutes, and it's just essentially like a, the mastery of fact fluency and things like that, which... Okay. Has, con has continued to be a, an area that we're, we're focused on. Lydia, I don't mean to interrupt, but can, just I want to hear it again from Sean. What, the K through 5, what are the assessments they're going to take, and what's the time it takes? Because I know that's a complaint we've heard from a number of parents about how much time their kids are sitting in assessment. Because they didn't used to take dibbles all the way through, and now they're going to be taking that, whatever that, I can't the say. Mm -hmm. The Acadians. <laughs> so can you just, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, laid out for us so we hear it and so people, if they have questions, Absolutely. can Absolutely. And, and part of this is a shift in, in thinking in the sense that these tools aren't something that is a summative where it's, it's going to influence grades or be even sent home in a report form. These are, uh, these are check-ins. These are formatives that help us to drive our instruction, change um, instructional pathways, differentiate, um, build groups for MTSS. That's the purpose of these. Um, in most cases, I don't know that we'd even report these to, 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 to parents. There's no reason to. It's really just like any type of exit ticket or, or small assessment a teacher would do it at the end of any lesson. You know, assessment is really a critical part of every lesson um, and, and how you uh, respond to that lesson the next day or even the next part of the day. So, you know, Dibble seems like, oh, it's something new or expanded. We are. We're going to be using it with more kids, but we feel like there's data that we don't have in some areas that we'd really like to, to improve. The only standardized, if you would, uh, would be the STAR assessment, uh, which is a replacement of MAP. So one is replacing the other, and it takes about 50 to 60% less time. Um, so we're talking about more instructional time, you know, less instructional time lost, and less testing overall. Um, PSSAs, obviously, we don't control that, uh, so that's going to continue as, as it would. Um, yes, so the standardized ones, if you would, more considered the STAR um, as a replacement of MAP. Um, but the other nice thing about STAR is that it's not fixed in time. We, we could choose, if we had students who were struggling, we wanted to you know, track them over time. We could, if we wanted to, 
use it more often. Uh, but the standardized will be no more than four times a year, more likely three times a year, which is what we've been doing for MAP. So it'll be three to four times a year for the K through five for the STAR 360, and MAPS is currently twice a year? It's uh, first through fifth. So right now, kindergarten Sorry, doesn't, first yeah, first through fifth. Through fifth. Right. And right, uh, we've, we've done different things. I think it's been two or three times a year for MAP. I'm looking at Jim because, yeah. I say I thought it might be three, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah we take the, typically administer the map in the in the winter and then again in the spring. So twice a year, and, and Dr. Dukevich was right. We estimate about 60 minutes for the map, you know, give or take, depending on how the student goes through it. Star closer to 25 minutes for math and 25 minutes for uh, for reading. So it is a much shorter assessment, and we do get the data immediately. So even doing three or four tests a year for maps, you would take less time than we're currently spending with the maps and you'd have pr presumably better progression throughout the yeah better on data. average all told it would be less time than the map assessment well not takes. necessarily if you're doing 25 minutes four times a year versus 60 minutes twice a year it's about the same it's 60 minutes for the math and also 60 minutes for the uh, for the reading for the map mm -hmm. as well so 60 minutes for each one of those assessments yeah but so that but twice a year rather than 25 minutes for each four times a year comes out the same yeah it's not a significant difference but ideally you're getting better points in time and if a kid is having an off day it's not one of the two times you've looked at them all year if you're looking three or four times hopefully you have yeah. a little bit better input yeah, yeah if, if, if I may uh, it, it seems that one helpful way to think about this is that um, the quick return on the data it it sort of underscores, highlights, enhances the overall ethos here, which is um, to monitor and evaluate kids' progress. Um, and also, that's just in line with MTSS, you know, the, the overall ethos of, of that particular program. Um, so I think that that, I think, I think that's another way to think about it, that this fits in with that overall plan and that overall strategy. Well, and, and so to tie into that, the one question I had, and I sometimes I hear things and I'm not sure I heard the right thing. So you said sometimes we might have one or two kids who are, or a few kids who are struggling. Would we ever administer the STAR just to a segment of a class? So that, I'm seeing Jim nod. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm just, so I'm thinking it, it might be used to really to target the kids who we know are struggling or who we know need help. We're working that out. I was just going to say, what it offers us is the opportunity to do that, where the map did not. Um, so we have, we have the opportunity with a lot of these products to use them very much more in a differentiated and personalized fashion, where before it was very fixed. We literally could, we couldn't access data until all students had finished testing, which oftentimes took six to eight weeks. So you talk about old data. Um, it was hard to act on it with, you know, with confidence sometimes, when if you were the first class to take it and you waited eight weeks later. I mean, students had progressed quite a bit since then. So it only became a benchmark and a placement criteria where we feel these products offer us far more opportunities than we've had before. I don't know, Dr. Kearney, if you had anything to add. No, I, th I think you said it. We would probably, we anticipate we'd use it as a benchmark for all students periodically throughout the school year. But then it does afford us the opportunity on as frequently as every two weeks to use the STAR assessment with those students who may be Tier 2 or even Tier 3, where we need a little bit more uh, immediate data, or frequent data, I guess it would be. So, so the, yeah, then the only concern I have is the point, you know, that kids are getting tested so regularly, they're, it's taking away from their instructional time. I'm assuming you would find a way to do that without taking away from instructional time. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the balances that we're always trying to strike. So likely it would happen during MTSS time, which is certainly instructional time, but it's, it's also that time where they're getting either the enrichment or the support that they need, and, and the assessment is part of that. So did I understand this correctly on the page with the finances? So in 23-24, we're going to have this hit of Link It with $63,000, but we're actually not paying $57,000 for a performance tracker? No, that's correct. So this year, it'll be 4500 because it's the current program we use. Now, that's a 20-year-old program that uh, Power School has let us know that they will no longer support that, and we have to do something. We have to either not have it or determine a new product. And 
it offers us, you know, we're used to that and we're very comfortable with that product, so we're not changing it this year. But alongside of that, um, with implementing Linkit, we're, we're able to open a far more comprehensive data processing um, system uh, to become comfortable with in our own way uh, before transitioning that completely away from Performance Tracker. If we were to not choose Linkit and just to upgrade their new version of this, that's where we're talking about 56,000 and change for the new version, which is a, has a lot of similarities to Linkit, but we, again, the team felt that Linkit was a, a superior tool. I don't understand what we're getting with Lincoln that we never had before that we need. Like, what yeah, I, is um, it that is worth $63,000? So can I, can I just take a crack yeah, at it? Because yeah, yeah. I, I asked this question to Lydia and I was, I said, okay. I, so my understanding, and they're going to, performance tracker is a tool we've had for a long time. It's right. the one that teachers use, and it collects a lot of data, right? And it allows us to analyze it in some way. But this version we have is so old, we can't have it anymore. So right now it's only costing us like $11,000, $11,000, dollars a year. We can't use that anymore. They're not going to support it. So that's why, and we talked about this. I actually really appreciate it. You guys brought up a lot of these issues last year or at least in the spring and talked about why you were doing these pilots. And this, this program is being sunset, so we have to pay for a new one, and the new price is close to $57,000 a year. For these additional things that... What are they that we don't ha didn't have before that you feel we need? So, so on page 15. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen this whole list, but like <laughs> we've done this for a long time. We've looked at student growth every year. What have we been doing that with? Because it, it didn't come out of nowhere. We did it with the power school, the performance tracker. Okay, so they're not going to support the piece that we use now. No, no, they are. It, it's it, the, the software we have is so old. It's it's like you can't buy certain you can't use certain Apple software anymore because Apple won't support it or Microsoft won't support it. This system is so old they won't support it anymore. We can't use it. So we have to get something new. And the e answer is either we get their new product or we get a different product. And that's what the group went looking at different products. I, if if I may, I mean I think Lydia, I think you're asking a fair question of. Perhaps in the presentation, maybe a little bit more of a granular comparison of performance tracker. Um, here, here's where it kind of leaves off. Here, what link, here's what Linkit, um, you know, provides that that performance tracker doesn't, because you know there you, you do provide some nice examples of what Linkit can do in the implementation slides, um, but maybe a, a bit more sort of comparative juice there. Um, well, I don't really want to go in the weeds anymore. I, I really don't need to. I guess I'm just wondering, what, you, you know what this sounds like on the, on the outside? It sounds like, oh, we have to have this data. Everybody's doing it. And school districts are going to pay 63000 for it. Well, well, why? Like, what actually, you know, is going to change what you're doing, <laughs> you guys? Uh, this year that we weren't doing before that we're going to get for that. It sounds like, I don't know, well, do you computer voodoo. I mean, but do you, do you <laughs> like want the detailed answer or not? I mean, I don't need to be in the weeds on what the issues are, but I, I need to hear what, and not from you guys, because you're sold. No, no, okay, no, cool. No, sort of what is it going to give you that you're not getting now that our kids have been missing for previous years or whatever? What? Um, I would say that part of the review process, we haven't used it yet, so we anticipate to learn more as we learn. But through the review process and the presentations, our anticipation is that Linkit does a much better job of collecting the data in one place and making it more usable for us. So it is true that our data is now housed in Performance Tracker, and we can run reports from it and do analysis from those reports. But an awful lot of that is done manually, where Linkit is, it should be more automatic than that, and based on what we saw, but still have to use and experience firsthand to learn more about, based on what we saw, it, se it seemed like the reports that we could run, the data that we could access, and how we could manipulate it was much more robust with Linkit than it is with at least the current version of Performance Tracker, which is, you know, I think many people find it to be clunky. 
So were we getting this data from the state before? Is that sort of what you're trying to backfill from? Or No, no. I mean, we did have PSSA and Keystone exams in, yeah. in performance trackers. So that is state assessment data. A lot of it was from our local assessments that either were hand-entered by teachers or somebody else or uploaded into, into performance tracker. There will still be some of that we anticipate with Linkit, but it also seems like there's some capacities for it to be automated in a way that performance tracker doesn't allow us to do. And then the reports that we could run, um, like I said, it seemed like we would be able to do, you know, get more robust and useful information um, from Lincoln than we can per currently with Performance Tracker. Among those, and I think this is what stood out to the group as they were thinking about using it with MTSS, was automatic, uh, you know, sort of groupings of students based on criteria that we set up, pulling multiple data points uh, in a, you know, in a visually appealing way that seems more useful for those people who are going to be using it than the spread. The, you know, the Excel, Excel spreadsheets that we are using before. So you think this is going to give a teacher in fourth grade a lot better information about how to help or where each student is or maybe that they don't need help, like exactly where each student in their class is than you had before? I think in the, at least the first, this year coming up and probably in, in year two and perhaps beyond that, it's going to allow the building and even district level teams who are manipulating the data to get access to better information that they can then work with fourth grade teachers and teams on to identify student needs and make groupings for MTSS. For this upcoming school year, I don't think we anticipate that our teachers are going to be interacting with Linkit very much directly. I think we need to, you know, ease into it a little bit more than that. Over time, we're hopeful that teachers are going to have more immediate access to data on their students in their classes to, yes, uh, have that information for a variety of data sources to inform their instruction. But that's, that, uh, you know, it's not this year coming up, and I don't know that it's going to be the year after that. Dr. Dukevich, you may have some more to add. Yeah, I was just going to point to, to slide 17 because I, I thought, I was thinking like you too, Lydia, like what does this do for us that we weren't able to do before? And I tried to capture that, and, and maybe I wasn't, I wasn't great at this part, but the, the, the five bullets at the top, it, as kind of Dr. Kearney shared, it offers us a far more practical and, and efficient way of pulling data together to show what the whole child is. Because we can pull in any kind of demographic, attendance, behavioral. The, this spans the gamut of data. It's not only MAP or PSSA, which, again, has been dated. Um, we're looking at PSSA data now in July that was administered in April. And then students have a summer and come back. I mean, that is so far away um, from when, where they were as learners at that point in time. We're trying to find data that's immediate, that we can act on it immediately, that we can really get a clear picture of where students are. And it paints a wide portfolio where they are not just a single snapshot months before. This is a portfolio of where the ch child is. And you may see other presentations from other places, not just in districts, but corporate. A lot of them come from Linkit. You'll hear source by Linkit, source by Linkit. I'm excited for some of the board presentations we'll be able to show you with some of the, the graphic representations of, of all different groups we have in the district and where they are. Uh, they'll, even do, they'll even go back historically and find uh, student profiles and where they, where they, uh, when they graduated Radnor, where they went to school and what was, their, what was their trajectory based on what classes they took and clubs they took. They can outline all that in, in like a, you create a pro, uh, kind of a profile for students. If you want to go to these schools, this is the profile that those schools accepted. And that's all, that all lives in data. You know, I don't think anybody loved big data, but this is big data. This is analytics. This helps us really get to the granular so that we can try to find root cause. Um, I'm excited. We sent our, we sent our coaches and um, Teji Brennan, our data uh, and assessment secretary, to a two-day workshop, and they came back. They were, all, they were all like, this is incredible, and we've never had anything like this. So gauging all that and the presentations we participated in, we're really excited about this one. So let's get back to the specifics of Acadians. Acad Acadians, am I saying that right? Um, so when they give dibbles, the teacher test each student individually. So that's a lot of time. Like they'll spend a week maybe going, doing everybody. So is it going to be the same now? Each student is going to be administered a reading and a math assessment individually, K through five in each class. That's what we're talking here. So our coaches were trained in this. They're going to be um, outlining, well, actually we're meeting with them full day tomorrow. This is one of our agenda items. It's just to uh, the practical implementation of it. Um, 
the, the reading component now has a digital format, so it's far more efficient in administration. Uh, historically, we've actually done, done this uh, testing for the teacher, so our, our literacy team will do it so that teachers aren't missing instruction or giving you know, independent work while they're doing it with students. So that's always been the case. We're just going to extend that beyond, and that'll be a preliminary um, kind of a universal screener. And then for math, it literally is, I'm going to defer to Dr. Kearney on this one, like a two-minute whole class administration, you collect it, and then it gets uploaded. I mean, it's really, it's really short. It's really kind of similar in a way to doing old, like an old-fashioned time test. It's not timed, but it's, it's a really brief probe, and then it feeds into the system, and then you can see where students are with their acquisition of uh, numbers and operations and, and just number sense, so, which are two qualities of foundational mathematics that you'll, every teacher will tell you, we need more number sense and operations, so it's going to help us monitor that more effectively. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, I think I asked that already. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Dr. Babson. So my reaction in the planning meeting was um, <clears throat> one of excitement and um, <laughs> slightly. <laughs> I'd like to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, no. Um, if there's a way to invest that's smart and beneficial for our kids, yeah, I am in favor of that. Um, and I think that this is a an intelligent and thoughtful, planful. Um, set of investments and I think that outlining as they've outlined here um, on that last slide I think that it I think that it overall makes sense I, I just had a very um, a very small question or, or idea there so with um, administering dibbles was there a cost associated with that that could be compared to a cadence so dibbles, we purchase the materials, and it's essentially consumables, but not, not very much. So that is a, you'll notice that is a difference in cost because of their data management system. Right. Um, and in full transparency, Dr. Kieran and I, this is our first year with it. We may come to find that we may not need the data management system because Lincoln may satisfy that need. Right. Um, and that's part of our, you know, implementation this year is to really, is that, a, is that an important component that we need as part of that, or are we able to do it uh, without it? So... Um, yeah, math will be new, and the, uh, the, I guess it's like the digital way of administering the dibbles part will be new. Um, but no, I think uh, the, the cost before was, was very minimal because it was paper pencil. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, you know, other than that, we've, we covered a good amount of ground in, in, our, in our previous meeting about, um, about some details. You know, I think that some of the questions they were were answered um, were, were, were posed by Lydia about performance tracker versus link it you sent me a link as I requested to uh, a demo I didn't get to it unfortunately but um, but I think that keeping an open mind as dr. Kearney is, has mentioned you know this is going to be a trial period um, there's nothing open shut here you know there's no blank checks flying around um, in, in the sense that we're willing to kind of look at this as a good tool uh, and I talk about link it but I could be talking about the array of tools that you've proposed here and I think overall it seems to me anyway that I'm just going to repeat something that I said earlier which is that you know RTI MTSS it's an Put away that label for a second and just think about the overall shift in approach. And you put it very well, um, Dr. Dukevich, of personalization and differentiation. Um, whatever you call that system, whatever shape that takes, these tools are meant to help that. And so there could even be efficiencies that could be found with these tools. So for example, it's possible that you find a kid at a place where he or she is that you might not have found otherwise. And you are able to shape the trajectory of that child in a way that actually saves money over time, perhaps. 
So there, there are different ways to think about cost. Um, and I do appreciate, Lydia, I really do, you know, the idea of, hey, are we just, you know, throwing money at this and are these just kind of like shiny bells and whistles? Um, but a lot of thought has been put into this. And, you know, one final point that I will make or maybe, a, maybe kind of hovering as a question is, um, how do we position our teaching staff for success with these tools and comfort, you know, and or enthusiasm? I mean, everyone's different, right? But I mean, um, is this just going to be another <laughs> thing that, that teachers have to add um, to their portfolio or to their, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, their, their toolkit? Um, will this create efficiencies? Will this create um, comfort where there might not have been before? I mean, the access to data, for example, that could be hugely beneficial. That, could, that right there could be a significant change in, in how teachers and students relate to each other. Um, so I, I see a lot of promise here. And I think keeping an open mind, you know, a trial kind of mindset um, is, that's reassuring to me. You know, we're not just kind of rushing in and saying, this is, you know, we're just going to do this. Thanks. Yeah, no, and I, I really appreciate that you've presented all this to us in the context of MTSS, but that these are very different systems and they do different things. I mean, the, the switch from MAP to STAR and Freckle is a different issue from switching from Performance Tracker to Link It. It's just that you're trying to, I think, essentially rip the Band-Aid all off at once. Um, and, and, and I think in some ways that makes sense for the team, especially if you've had some experience with some of these systems. Um, I think I also heard you say you've, you've talked to districts who have made these changes and seen that they, they've all said that it was a, a positive change, both in the change to STAR and the change to Link It. Is that fair? Uh, we, we've specifically we're working with a, a district outside of Pittsburgh that's very similar to us <laughs> in size and demographic and everything else. They shifted to STAR and actually saw significant gains in achievement, uh, such that they rose in their, not that again this is the end all be all, but in their rankings, um, I think it was over by 10, by 10 ranking points or something like that. And they were, they were published around uh, that STAR uh, was a driving catalyst for that work because it brought analytics to the surface and, was, and enabled teachers to make um, informed decisions on instructional change. Um, so that was, that was a shift that we were learning from them. And actually we've been corresponding with um, a previous member of the district who now works for Renaissance, um, but has a lot of overlap and has been sharing uh, his experiences. So, yeah, and there's other districts as well that have moved away from different places and landed in STAR. I would trust that they have gone through a very similar process than we have, and there's good reason for that change. Um, and we're going to continue to, you know, engage with those as well to find out what, what was their first and second year like and what could we learn from that process. So I actually had, I wanted to kind of drill down, though, a little bit on some of the costs just for an understanding for this group, but also for the community. The, the link that you have listed is an annual subscription of $63,000. Is that just, that's a district, no matter how many seats we're using. So it's not a seat license, it's not a user license, it's a district license. So if we wanted to put every teacher in the district on link it and give them access to that, it would still only cost us $63,000. Yeah, that's, that's the contract. And this contract, again, this includes a lot of professional development for us up front. Um, it's good. conceivable that that number could go down uh, because we may, not, we may not need that in, in the subsequent years. Uh, there's also a number of products within that overall Linkit um, system that we may find are more or less usable or more or less advantageous for us. So that is right now the high cost. Now, I, this is a year contract. Next year, I don't know what, it'll, what it will be, but... Um, yeah, just, and, and you guys have both alluded to this, is we're, we are analyzing the systems and our use of them as much as the systems are helping us to analyze data, so. Well, and that was one of the things I was going to ask you, and, and it, I know you're always actually pretty careful about the budget and making sure you're not spending money you don't need to spend. I would just hope that especially in the first year or two where you're really getting a sense of it, that you do kind of test each of those apps and, and understand, you know, this is an add-on and if, and you know what, we won't really use it. Or it's an add-on and we would use it except that the cost to input the data to use it will be so much more that we don't think there's actually value. So I just, I would ask that you're thinking in those terms as well. Which brings me to my next point about the data because you were talking about how you know you can track kids, even students, even years after they've left the district. 
And you mentioned that some of this data can be automatically input, but some of it still may be manual. And I'm wondering if you've looked at, if you're sure that there will be some kind of efficiencies and, and if we have a way to figure out how to f perfect some of the inefficiencies. So I know when I've implemented software systems at work, you know, you can have them build a pipeline, right, where the data we've got feeds in, but sometimes it has to be customized. So, and I, I understand there's a cost to that, but it should be kind of a one-time cost. And if that saves us a lot of busy work for somebody in the district who could be doing something more meaningful, I would hope you're looking into that as well. Jim's smiling. <laughs> I, I think, no, that, that was among the appeals to link it, is that they do seem to pull in from a lot of different systems and, and allow us to access it in one place. So I don't know that at this point it would pull in from all the data sources that we have, but it does seem to pull from multiple data sources, and that was an appeal. And I would just add, and I want to give a shout out to Dr. Hand, who was actually part of all these processes and asked so many critical questions <laughs> that Lincoln and other uh, companies have actually added and changed practices uh, to ensure the fidelity and uh, security uh, of their data warehouse um, access. So. Um, Dr. Hans is a difficult, <laughs> he could be a difficult cookie to crack, uh, crack from these companies' perspectives because he has really good questions and we want really good answers to make sure that um, our data is secure and that in the case of any type of issue that, we, you know, we have the right channels in place to make sure that things are resolved. So we've, I think we've checked every box um, from my perspective on this, but um, as far as the preparation to bring this to you, um, and again, we have really high hopes on, on what it can allow us to do. Okay, so you actually anticipated because I had a security of data question, and I, I figured uh, Dr. Hand would have asked for their SOC 2 audits and things like that, <laughs> so just that's good. Um, but so there's not an initial cost. A lot of times companies, you know, have an extra line item for uploading your data the first time. That's all included in this. Okay, and um, one of the thoughts I had, and it goes to Andrew's point, but just to be more specific about it, um, we do have teachers who love technology. We have teachers who, you know, love what they've got and don't want to have to do anything else, and I get that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I know there are teachers who love new things and are always looking for something else, and I'm just wondering, I really appreciate the idea of limiting it maybe the first year to the administrators and instructional coaches, but I wonder if, you know, you might put it out there, if there are teachers who really are interested in this, we'd be happy to give you, you know, a license to look at your kids just because they can be the advocates you need on the ground, right? The reality is you're still administrators. The instructional coaches are still your mouthpieces to some teachers, right? And the teachers want to be able to talk to other teachers who say, actually, this is a really good system and it was really helpful and I was able to help this student because I saw X, Y, Z. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we will find uh, that there'll be some early adopters who want to get their hands on the data. And I, we talked about maybe in the new year, once we model and engage with them and they can see the features that we may have people going, oh yeah, I forget performance tracker, let me jump into Lincoln next. So we'll have some of those folks, it's, it's inevitable. So yeah, we'll, we have the ability to do that with our contract. Um, so we can add on whenever we choose to start. Okay, no, that's, re that's really helpful and I just, um I think this is great. I know you guys will be good stewards and, and careful about whether we need all of this, um, especially if the Linkit is providing data analysis that the, we don't need the other systems for. Um, and I, I appreciate you made a comment at the beginning, you know, hopefully MTSS will become so standard we don't have to do regular updates. But I do think, um, especially given the investment we're making, you know, this year in STAR, but also the increase in costs um, for the other programs and the change, I would hope that we put it on the calendar uh, either for spring or for fall, you know, kind of when you guys are ready to present it, but to make sure that the, the community gets an update, the committee and, and thereby the community gets an update on how this is progressing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned a school outside of Pittsburgh, and you said that they showed tremendous growth, I think, from using LinkedIn. How did they measure the data, though? Because they had nothing. What system did they use before? How did they get a measurement of change in data? Because they switched to a whole new system. It wasn't LinkedIn. In that respect, it was STAR 360 adoption. And, and that data was their, their rankings amongst the state were actually relative to PSSAs. But STAR okay. was the catalyst that helped to bring the analytics and the data to, to the surface, which helped teachers make instructional changes, which helped students progress further, which raised their achievement. So the, the whole domino effect helped the district raise their okay. achievement. Okay, so it was measured actually on PSSA results. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. 
I could share that article with yeah. you too, by the way, if you're interested. No, I trust yeah. you. <laughs> I just was curious. Um, is this Renaissance, is this the, the institution like, I don't know, two decades ago that started with um, charter schools? They ran a bunch oh, of charter schools. No, no, schools. no. This is a, a, um, a, a company that publishes materials, curriculum, and okay. they don't monitor schools. They don't operate schools in any face, uh, facet at all. I don't know where I got that. Okay. They had the same, there was a, a school in Phoenixville called Renaissance. But the, the, uh, the charter you're referencing is um, Edison Schools. Oh, I so, but they yeah. were originally Renaissance. They but were. they were no affiliation to this. Not or at what, all. Not at all. Was it sold off from them or? Renaissance Academy of Phoenixville is no longer affiliated with Edison. They're their own charter, fully on their own. I know that because I taught there for a little while. <laughs> so this is very specific. But they had other charter schools that yes, were Edison called Renaissance. Yes, Edison had over 150 schools nationwide, but they're, they're no longer in business. But the, and they were never affiliated with this Renaissance? No, this is a private company that relates to curriculum materials, programs, things like that. That sounds like a trademark problem, doesn't it, <laughs> or copyright? <laughs> um, I think this is an awful lot of money for data, and you know that I love data, and I love to, you know, show that what we're doing and help kids. Um, I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think this is an awful lot of money to spend on stuff that really, uh, this first year, it's going to be you guys churning this data around. We're, it's not really a lot of it going to be seen even in the classroom. Um, so Lydia, if I may, and I know you I'm would rather hear from them, but just let me, it, to point out the yeah. numbers. So there, there are two separate types of systems here, and I think this is something I could have helped you and said, you know, like break out these tables separately. But So let's break it out for Lydia and for anybody in the community who's asking. The first thing is a testing system, right? And that's the map. Right. And that's 51,000 that we're switching to Renaissance, which is over 50. 50,000, no, it's going to be less than $50,000 a year for the three years, right? It's going to be 124000 And in the future, it's going to jump because we're not going to have the ESSER funds, but it's 169000 for three years. So it is more than fifty one, but it, it's not a huge jump. I, I need Susan here to do that math for me really quickly, but it's... It, it's a $6,000 difference per year. Okay, again, between yep. MAP and, and right. STAR. Right, so we're just replacing well, one with another. But you're assuming that it doesn't go up. Wasn't that the one well, you said you don't but, know? But this for now, it's, we, we've locked in the price for three years because we're paying for it in advance, right? And, and that can come out of the, the curriculum budget that we've set aside if we had issues in the annual budget. But Yes. So And then separately, we've got a, a, test, a, a data tracking program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the performance tracker versus Link It. And the performance tracker would be 57000 well, Th That's what they currently use, Lydia. That's what they have. Assuming that we want to have all of that, which... But, but the point is, have. it goes away. That's, what I'm that's the piece, Lydia. But she's, it goes away. Like, they either have nothing or they pay 57000 as a minimum. So you're telling me there's nothing in between. There's, you either have to get this $57,000 performance tracker or this Link It 63000 there's no, we used to pay 10,000, 11,000. There's no 11,000 option out there anymore for anybody. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Well, let me <laughs> Maybe ask, we let don't me, want that Let product, me ask another question that might help. What is the overall difference between what we've been paying and then what we're adding? So what if you look at the current existing programs and new program, because we have been spending a lot of money on performance tracker and we'll continue to spend that money. So when you say, what's that $11,000 option? Well, we've had an option that's been far more expensive than $11,000 in performance tracker. Oh, that's not reflected here? Because you have 11000 for this year for performance tracker. Was so uh, there were extra costs. I, I'm happy to jump in, uh, and I think that your point's well taken, Mrs. Solomon. Like we want to make sure that we're good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Um, the current uh, program that we have with Performance Tracker is not a. Um, it's a very clunky. I think uh, Dr. Kearney used the the word. Um, very appropriately. It is not a very user-friendly program. It doesn't, uh, it's very difficult to pull um, reports from it. Uh, and when we started to look at it, this is something that's come up uh, for a number of years that we needed to look at this, we needed to look at this. Um, so we knew that this is something that as a district we would really have to look at Performance Tracker. Um, 
staying with what we currently have is not an option. Um, and so when we looked at the current version of Performance Tracker and what we needed it to do, um, the red at the very bottom column, uh, it would have been $56,680 for the 22-23 school year if we said, we're going to go with the PowerSchool product. We're going to stick with perf the upgraded version of Performance Tracker, which is the, and it's not called Tracker, is it called? Performance Plus. Performance Plus is the newer, the newest version, um, and so if we said we're going to stick with PowerSchool, it would have been almost fifty-seven thousand uh, dollars. But one of the things that we did is we brought in as a district three different vendors and had a committee that was involved that that had um, central office, it had teachers, it had um, school district uh, administrators, it had a number of different stakeholders in it that. Uh, looked at the products that heard from the vendors, um, and then, then they rated uh, based on what they saw. And Link It came out at the top. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is, uh, with that red at the bottom of the performance tracker, is compare apples to apples. Because when you do see 11.4, which is a non-option for us moving forward, there is a stark contrast when you're looking at 63 for Link It. But really, an apple to apples comparison is 56,680 for performance, uh, for the performance plus moving forward, um, or the Link It, which when you look at the cost differential between the two of those, it essentially comes out to under $2 a student for a year for us to go with the product that the committee comprised of teachers and people that really dig into the data thought was the best. So when we looked at it, we're like, okay, well, it's less than $2 a kid, um, and it really meets our needs. And going in, we knew that we had gaps as far as meeting our needs with data analysis. Um, looking at apples, apples, and saying performance plus, company number three and link it like link it's the best when we looked at the rubrics for the the committee members and we can afford it and it's a dollar 85 more a student we figured let's go with the product that we know that's going to work and meet our needs so how much work is it going to be for you guys to switch over to all this now because people are used to 10 years of something else so all of this is a ton of work. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, no, yeah. I, I, and, and, and it's been a ton of work for the last three years. Mm -hmm. But this is what we're here to do. I mean, we're here to try to improve the educational program um, for all of our kids. And we talk about making sure that all of our kids are receiving that education and that we are diagnosing and understanding all those learning needs and giving our teachers the best tools possible to respond to those needs. So th this is a progression on that. Um, I mean, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but if you want us to slow down, we can slow down. <laughs> um, yeah, um, but it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work, but it's the work that we should be doing. And you think the teachers, I don't know how to say this. I mean, well, I, I think yeah, some I, will be excited. I think a lot will not be excited about changing up stuff. And I'm happy to jump in there. I do not think that we will be having a funeral procession for our performance tracker. Um, there are a lot of people that feel uh, we've been hearing from teachers about how clunky it is and how difficult it is to use. So I think this will be a welcome change moving okay. forward. And the team has been very smart administratively. They've included teachers in this. So, you know, teachers have been part of analyzing, looking at understanding this now yes those are sometimes your early adapters but those teachers are looking at it and saying oh my gosh look at what we could do with this well thank you for answering all my questions I I'm still a skeptic but I'm um, you know the other thing I think I was just gonna ask because I think you had the, the Acadians is a definite we're adapting we're adopting that the IXL I thought was kind of even more in a test phase that we're kind of going to see if that's really something we need. So ideally, over the next three years, this is a worst case scenario, and you're looking for ways to iron this out and hone it to what we actually need to, to function and succeed. I, we're not looking for clunky performance, but we, but we want it to be helpful, yeah, not over the top. Aside from the adoption of STAR 360, which is a three-year contract and afforded us a $20,000 reduction over the course of those three years by adopting a three-year, and we felt really good about that, 
every other contract that's on there is a one year. So we're not obligated beyond next school year. We could very much, you know, come to the conclusion at the end that we want to look elsewhere, we want to continue, or anything under the under the sun, really. But yeah, I mean, we're going to be analyzing these very closely. We never want to spend money uh, for for no good reason. And um, you know, to the point that's been made a couple times now, those four areas I shared about those data needs, they they've come very much directly from teachers. We don't have enough data. It's old. It doesn't help me formative assess uh, my students. There's no good progress monitoring tools. I mean, if I heard that once, <laughs> I heard it a hundred times. So those four areas were. Um, identified needs, and then we went out to try to source solutions to meet those needs. Okay. I think we've beat them up sufficiently about this for today. <laughs> Lydia's got more questions, and, and, and we're going to get updates. I mean, I, I, you guys know we, we will ask the tough questions again next time. But, um, but I really appreciate, I appreciate the thoughtfulness in engaging the various parties. I appreciate that you've it may not feel like it today, but that we, you've eased us into this by running pilots and explaining what you were thinking. Um, and and I, I have high hopes that it's a success and that instead of adding work for the teachers, which I know it will, that ultimately it will ease. I know the MTSS is a lot more work for a lot of people and hopefully this will support that instead of um, adding to it. So um, with that, I, I guess we can, move on to uh, item 4.2 on the agenda, uh, which is the belonging through a culture of dignity overview. Mr. Bechtel, were you going to give a summary on this, or is this uh, that's, Dr. Dukevich that's again? That's me again. Um, uh, but I want to say that I, I get the privilege of sharing what we're looking to do this year with our book study, but this has been the culmination of many voices again, many conversations. It's been an iterative process. Um, and actually, I think it's been very well received from our staff. Uh, so this front page, the board will recognize because it was included in uh, the books when we dispersed those. And it's really just a summary of what we're looking to do this year. Um, in a sense, we've purchased this book for every Radnor employee, uh, over 650 books. And I'll look at Tricia back in the, in the room because she did that, those purchases. Um, but we purchased this book for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it's come recommended through different channels. Uh, UPenn did a, a full day um, recently that some of us were able to engage with. Um, and we felt this was a really great next step uh, with the work we did with Sage prior, uh, which helped inform um, and, f and provide a foundation for this work going forward. The other thing we're looking to do is add a climate survey for our students and our, and our staff uh, that would be universal and the same. Uh, that climate survey is a well-used tool. It's been around since the 1990s. It's called the Psychological Sense of School Membership, and it's based on the four indicators of belonging. So we'll be administering that uh, in the fall, um, in October, and then uh, again in the, um, in the early winter. On the back of the next page, I should say, is a timeline and summary of what we're looking to do over the course of the year in implementing this plan. Uh, so again, we've had numerous administrative meetings, many of the, which have been direct correspondence with uh, at least one of the authors, John Cronapple. Uh, we have distributed those books to every individual. We even have books ready for new staff who are onboarding, uh, so they'll have those. We, uh, we facilitated our first administrative and school board orientation on July 26. Our next one is coming up uh, on August 26, a half day with the authors then again. And again, that, that whole work, that work is meant to really provide the administrative team and the school board with a common language and, and a common lens on what we're moving to do. Then we're having uh, John Cronapple join us at convocation for a, an opening speech, and that's to, to all staff members. That'll be on August 29th. And then from there, the plan is for uh, John directly and members of his facilitation team to work with our building administrators and support a, a, a rich and arduous book study um, to really br bring out the content from this book and the research and then put it into practice. Um, so that work will be working with each uh, building administrative team uh, and whatever team they have that they've selected to help move that forward, as well as helping to analyze the result of that uh, PSSM survey and then create uh, whatever steps or actionables uh, that are result are a result of those surveys. We're also going to have a community conversation with uh, author John Cronap on, on October 18. So he'll be in person. Uh, we'll get that out to the community so he can share uh, directly with the community and answer questions about uh, the research and the purpose for this book. 
The other piece I wanted to highlight here was uh, many of our, our book study works well with typically teachers and staff who are present at the building level, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't always enable to include food service and, and custodial folks and bus drivers and even administrative folks in this building. So we have plans to engage with them on district-wide PD day, so there's no students here. We're going to offer like a lunch and learn, so we'll have an opportunity to engage with all those folks too, so that everyone has an opportunity to be part of this, um, thus underscoring belonging. <laughs> so in essence, I'm just sharing again an iterative process that we've worked through where we're taking this in, in, uh, in the next year, and um, I think it's easy to say we've been really excited about this, and we've had really universal positive feedback um, from folks. We want to share this tonight because on the committee that will move forward to the full board is the contract to work um, with the authors throughout the year. So this work here that's being outlined from, you know, May through March, we're contracting, um, you know, with the authors uh, to work with us throughout the year. And that's one of the things on the approval for next week. And just to clarify, that contract covers all the costs of this, including the facilitation of uh, administrative meetings, the community event, the, any kind of work that their team would be doing with the district. Th that is correct. Okay, thanks. Did uh, Ms. Solomon or Dr. Babson, do you have any questions? Okay. I, you know, I think this is, uh, this is great. I know, Dr. Bachelor, this was a book you had found for us, and, um, you know, it, it I think the meetings did go very well the first time. Um, you know, it was less a meeting and more of kind of a seminar and uh, good interactions among the participants. So I, I was very encouraged that people there were asking, but how do I help? How do I help? You know, and it's no, no, we're going to do the building blocks, right? You don't start with calculus. You start <laughs> with addition and subtraction. So it was um, very positive uh, response, I think, in those meetings. And, and I just want to thank... Uh, you know, Dr. Dukevich, Mr. Bechtold, and all the administrators, because all the administrators, as, as I think Sean was mentioning, are all working together on this, and the board. You know, we have not done a session where we had initial training, and it was our administrative team and the board together. Uh, we have part two of that coming up, as a reminder, uh, over Zoom. Uh, and, uh, but it's been exciting to see uh, how this is being embraced by everyone. Great. Um, no objections to moving that along. Uh, item 4.3, the health and safety plan review. So I'm going to confess my first response was, why do we still have this? I actually got calls from board members. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Get rid of the health and safety plan. Leave it alone. Uh, but Mr. Beck told you, uh, informed me, <laughs> you informed me that was not an option. So do you want to just uh, give the explanation here? So because we accept ESSER dollars, districts are required to have uh, health and safety plans. Uh, they um, need to be updated every six months, and so we are updating it now. And so for people that are uh, excited to see it come around again, they can mark their calendars for uh, either January meeting, and we will be back here uh, revising it. Um, but this is something that, that districts are required to do. So. Um, in board docs, we've got changes to the health and safety plan, and what I'll say is, um, you know, we, we've been through uh, some challenges over the last couple years, but thankfully the situation is, is much uh, improving, um, and uh, new information is, is coming out, and uh, so just uh, last week on Friday, the CDC went and, and published uh, uh, new guidelines for schools, and earlier in the week, uh, CHOP had put out information as well. Um, and after reviewing the, that guidance and, and really looking at um, our health and safety plan, uh, we're gonna operate very similarly to as we did at the end of last school year in May and June, uh, with some exceptions, and, and those are noted here in red if you're if you're at home and you're checking this out. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that students uh, will not be potted or cohorted. Uh, another thing is that students who are exposed to COVID-19 will not be required to quarantine. Uh, and because quarantine does not exist, that is something that the CDC came out with on Friday about not quarantining, and that's something that CHOP Policy Lab came out prior to that, the week, uh, a couple days prior, uh, test to stay won't be used. Test to stay was a tool for districts when you had a student that would experience quarantine. Uh, both CDC and CHOP 
encourage people who are ill, uh, particularly those with a cough, muscle aches, and a fever, to stay home. And that's one of the things that we're going to preach here is we're going to say, if you're sick, stay home. Take a sick day. Um, and uh, so the district will continue to publish uh, our known COVID-19 cases uh, for the start of the school year. So our dashboard will kick off uh, for the first, uh, for the beginning of the year. Uh, but we are uh, relieved that we are getting back. I think we used a better normal. We are progressing, moving forward, and on the endemic road where, um, you know, we're looking forward to, uh, we were very pleased to see that both the CDC and CHOP um, loosening the guidelines. So this is something that, as a district, we're required to do, and so that's why it's coming uh, in front of curriculum, and also we'll go to the, the full board uh, for approval. We'd ask that we'd be moved forward to the full board for approval. And our, our plan is to start off the year showing the dashboard. We may continue it, we may discontinue it. We've debated back and forth whether we need to be showing the dashboard uh, anymore. Um, and uh, we, at this point, have decided, you know, we'll still publish it, share it on our website. I won't be sharing it monthly at board meetings anymore. I think we've turned a page uh, moving forward. Uh, but as long as we were collecting that data, um, we thought, why not still put it on uh, the dashboard for our parents and families uh, to be able to see. But I don't know if we'll, how long we'll continue it. Um, you know, as we move forward and we get into the new year. Can I just, for people who, because when you say, oh, there's no more quarantine, so can I just throw out a, like two hypotheticals and you tell me how the district will deal with them so people understand what the change might be? Um, my, my student in the high school gets a call on a Saturday from a friend, I've COVID positive, we were all at a party last night, you're probably going to want to test. That means my high school student should test and be responsible and watch for symptoms, but it doesn't mean I have to call or email the district over the weekend. It doesn't mean my high school student can't go to school on Monday, assuming my high school student has no symptoms. That is, that is correct. Okay. Um, alternative, you've got an elementary school student who tests positive for COVID, has a fever, they stay home. But if by day three, they have no fever, then on day four they could come back to school or they have to stay out the full five days? So the CHOP policy uh, lab guidelines that came out said that, um, that we want to see improving symptoms. We want to see that if a student has cough, body aches, um, we want to see those things significantly improving. Uh, but we also want to see that they have no fever without the use of fever reducing medication for a minimum of 24 hours. So when they hit that benchmark, then students are allowed to return to school. Okay, and just to be clear, the rule has always been your student needs to be 24 hours clear of a fever without any kind of medication before they're supposed to come back. That is correct. We're just asking to people to be that much more careful about it because of the when you say rules always been yeah pre covid pre covid that, that was, was the district guidance. rule yeah. yeah so that was always i think the the medical and school guidance even pre covid yes right okay so and the idea is if your child is sick let them stay home and and if your high school student is sick and they don't want to stay home remind them it's better to stay home and get healthy we all and, and the same for the adults in the buildings i think too a lot of us figure i can power through work but if you if you're sick um, yes, yeah, so we're home. encouraging people not to power through. So if you don't feel well, stay home. <laughs> Take a sick day. Okay. No, I, I appreciate you clarifying that because I think they're, you know, having it out and maybe even just laying that out in the board meeting in brief, two, you know, brief explanations, just so it's very clear to the community and nobody's saying, oh, my neighbor sent kids in um, th that were following the rules. You, we could we could have a, you could stage that same question and Mr. Bechtold could provide that same answer at the board meeting. That would be great. Perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll tag team that. Um, oh, sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I want to, so are you done with the COVID piece of this? I want to take this yeah, conversation in a plan. really sure. different yeah. direction, and you, nobody may know the answer to this, but we're now hearing about monkeypox. <laughs> what did you receive? Did you receive anything with regard to health and safety that pertains to monkeypox? Are they talking about that, what we need to do? So, and I'm going to kick it to, to Dr. Batchelor on that. Um, we have not received any, uh, you know, specific guidance. I did meet today, um, you know, with 
um, medical doctors uh, and other superintendents today to just talk about the coming year. Uh, the one piece of information that was shared from us is that, you know, um, with monkeypox, it is a prolonged uh, exposure of, of bodily fluids that is what they are concerned about. Um, and it is that prolonged, you know, intense exposure. Um, uh, so yes, is it, you know, so there, there wasn't as much fear. I, I think that the, the piece that for me as a parent and educator, um, what we're hearing, of, um, and, and I don't want to be alarmist, but some of the news uh, about in New York about polio and what's going on. And I think we as a district need to really be talking and reviewing, making sure that everyone has their vaccinations. And um, that's, I think for schools, that's a, a little, that gives me more pause and, and more area of focus right now for schools as we're opening to make sure that our vaccinations are up, that our nurses um, are, are communicating to our communities, that our principals are sharing to make sure that everyone has the required vaccinations uh, to be in school. So last year we had additional nursing staff. Are we going to be keeping the additional staff on or are we going back to more like pre-COVID levels or what is our plan? I'm going to have to check. I can't remember exactly how we, uh, I'll have to check and get back to you. I forget how we left the, the, the status. I would think, though, for checking vaccinations, that's something the nurses have always been pretty diligent about, and that's something yes. that we didn't need additional staff for. No. I think a lot of the staffing no. was COVID-related, as you pointed out, Lydia. No. So hopefully if we're not having a lot of tests to stay, and you know that all of that would alleviate the need for additional staff. Um, but the same with the monkeypox, you know, if you're sick, stay home. I, I guess on that note, um, parents may be concerned about their kids missing, you know, three, four, five, you know, if it, if it just continues to, you know, if kids continue to exhibit some kind of symptoms from COVID, you're saying. From COVID yeah. um, you know, I, I guess that, that as a parent, that would be a concern that I would have, you know, if my child's symptoms just kind of continued. But if they had a lingering cough but no body aches, I mean, there is some gray area here to kind of tease out. And I would imagine that some people might ask in some instances, hey, what about that, you know, Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, um, camera on the class kind of thing? Um, you know, is there any any comment? I, I figure that that this committee discussion is a is an appropriate place to discuss such things. So. And and I think this is one of those classic moments where the three of us are looking at each other, going, "Where exactly are we on that?" Um, <laughs> I uh, saw those. Looks. I, I'm I'm going to say I, I swear, I'm going to say is just, no. I'm, this I'm is good. Walking no, up the it's street. a good. It's a no, great no question that we've been having no conversations. Yeah. We want to make sure that we include our our teachers in this conversation, uh, and I think that's where it is right now. Um, that we want to make sure we're having. Um, a conversation with our principals and teachers about the future and how we want to use that. And I don't think we have an answer right now, but um, I'll look to the team if there's any more to that. I think you've hit the nail on the head. We have been having discussions about that at this point. Um, and so I, I don't think that we have a, an answer currently that we could provide today. And, and, and our, our, you know, to put it out there, we want, when kids are sick, they should take a sick day. You know, we don't want, we, we never set up the Zoom to happen right away. It didn't happen that day. If a student, it was always a 24 hours, like the next day. Um, we ran into some, some challenges that, you know, kids were sick and they even, shouldn't even been Zooming. Like they need to just be, ha let them have a sick day. We're trying to balance that with, we do have new technology that does allow us that it's not the best form of education, but in some circumstances, um, that availability under certain conditions is beneficial for a student to be able to see what's going on and move along. So we want to, we're, we're trying to balance those things and have some discussions with our principals and teachers about what does this mean? And I think more to come. I, I think that's fair. This is a complicated, complicated matter. I, I, I would simply think that from a parental point of view, you would just ask, is my child, um, you know, on the, on the one hand, you want to promote the idea of if you're sick, if you're sick, stay home, i.e., you know, it's in everyone's best interest that you stay home, really. 
Um, but on the other hand, you don't want your kid to miss out on the on any kind of instructional experience. Is there some kind of um, at some point are they losing something? You know, so that does seem to me the the balance to be struck. And, and but I and I think Ken's point. Yeah. When I had I was sick for four solid days. I had fevers through the medication. I was I couldn't even focus to read my work email. I mean, I was really sick. So if your kid is sick and they have a fever, they should be napping and sleeping, right? They shouldn't be trying to attend class. And that's the balance. And so then you've got that one day where between, you know, and I think we're going to have to let the administration work with the teachers and figure out. And, and there may be special situations for certain students. And, and no some comment. parents may just say, I want to keep my home and leave alone. True. <laughs> and th no comment about video games or TV or whatever. That's, <laughs> that's a whole nother. <laughs> that's a whole separate set of medication. <laughs> Um, Thank you. So if, we've, if we have exhausted this, uh, item 4.4 is the agenda item, action items. And these are the contracts that ostensibly, most of them are contracts we've ostensibly talked about um, in the prior agenda items, which I really appreciate, by the way. I know you moved this to the end of the agenda. Um, I think it was really helpful for us to have all the context for the contracts. But um, I think there were some items that aren't on that that you wanted to highlight for us. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Mr. Sure. Certainly. And... Uh, we have um, a renewal for math and focus for uh, K to eight, and that's a one-year renewal. Uh, Dr. Kearney has been working with our math teachers to look at math and focus this year. So we've got a one-year renewal, and then we will be coming back uh, in the spring to talk about math and focus. Uh, we already talked about um, uh, at Read 180, System 44, and Math 180, we already have. This is a, a renewal, renewal of our license and consumables, but it is above the threshold, so we bring this to the board. Um, we already talked about Renaissance uh, Stars 360 and Frackle. We talked about IXL, talked about Linkit. Um, we've got the contract for uh, Brand New Mountain Virtual Academy, which is the Radnor Cider Academy contract for the CCIU. Um, that is the, the number there is TBD because it is based on student and the number of classes that the student takes. So if one student is taking eight classes and another student is taking six classes, uh, it is based on the total number of classes that, uh, and the total number of students. So that is a uh, per student per class uh, cost. Are uh, you able to just give us a ballpark number of students, general number of classes? So um, it's dependent upon level as well because uh, we've got students, uh, grades uh, in elementary, middle, and high school that take it. Typically, uh, high school students uh, are required to take six and a half to eight. Um, you could have uh, students at the middle school that would take six or seven. Um, I can't speak to elementary. They would definitely have their core subjects and then, and then some sort of other type of elective. Um, so it, it's really dependent upon the... Um, the level that they're at to, to take that. So our numbers for um, um, the Radnor Cyber Academy, we've been monitoring those, um, and they are, we're at four students currently that are signed up for Radnor Cyber Academy. Uh, we ended the year, Dr. Dukovic, about 20 last year. Uh, so we, uh, you know, I, I think that we have the option for people that need it, but we also have seen a significant return to in-person instruction, and so um, it's an option for families. So we have four students that are enrolled for this fall. Correct. And what is it roughly per student? Like 5,000, 10,000? I understand it varies. Like it was 17? Do you have any idea? It, it very much depends, like, like um, yeah. Mr. Bechtold said, on what they choose and, and what the expansiveness of their, of their caseload. But I think last year as we started out, it was in the 8,000 uh, ballpark per student, um, which, you know, if we go to another cyber, we're paying typically far more than that. So... Uh, and Dr. Ham would probably be the best authority to answer that question as he's directly overseeing the, the, um, the work with uh, the CCIU and, and the Brandywine Virtual Academy, but I think roughly it's between eight and 10,000 a student. Okay. Thanks. All right, and then we've got uh, the Acadians, which we've talked about. We've got a bus contract for Camp Canadensis in there. Um, we have the... Um, DEI consultants for belonging through a culture of dignity, which we talked about. We have three student clubs that are all at the high school, Latinx, Kits for Kindness, and Mountain Biking. Um, 
and then we have an overnight student trip. So uh, if you've been on campus this week, yesterday was the opening day for all sports and activities. Um, we've got our cheerleading team that is looking to take a trip to Pine Forest Camp, um, and the district um, transportation cost will be $15.96 to go to that. And then we've got the 520.1 plan. Uh, earlier in the spring, I believe it was at the uh, at, in May, we had the uh, flexible instructional day application that the board approved. 520.1 we've used uh, throughout COVID, and this is gives us flexibility um, that are COVID-related emergency expenses. So FIDS uh, could be for a variety of things. They could be for COVID, but they don't necessarily have to be for COVID. They could be for power outages and, and water main breaks and et cetera. So uh, this gives us just flexibility uh, as we wrap up COVID and continue to move forward in case we'd have something that would come up. Um, and then we've got the approval of the health and safety plan, which uh, we already went through. Can I ask one question on the Camp Canadensis contract? So I, I appreciate that we're getting that locked down now because I know in past years we've had trouble with transportation. I know um, one of the board members had asked me if there was any kind of travel insurance if for some reason we can't go. I know one year there was, they had some kind of monumental rain and, <laughs> and they were evacuating the county. Um, and I remember the answer, but I just would rather, I guess, you guys answer me on whether there's travel insurance for this. Yeah, so we don't pay this right now. We pay a small deposit. I believe it's $500. And then uh, this happened before COVID. So we had them, we had them locked in. Uh, then COVID happened. We had to cancel. And so that $500 rolled to the next year. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, rolled to the next year. So, um, yeah, that's, that's typically what they'll do is they'll just roll it to the next year if, for some reason, we have to cancel. There are some... There is some language in the contract about how, how far away you are from the trip before you cancel, uh, just like most cancellations. So we'll be monitoring that and, you know, knock on wood, hopefully there's, there's no question about cancellation. We had a great, we had a great camp in Dentist last May. Great. Ms. Solomon, I think I heard you say you had a question. Okay. Um, and are we, I, I apologize, I didn't get a chance to read the whole contract. Are we locking in gas prices now or is that a variable? <laughs> it may work in our favor. Who knows? Yeah, I, I don't believe that's. That actually is stipulated in the contract. It's just the, the the cost is the same vendors we've used before is up, and I think that's reflective of the gas prices and driver shortages. So, no, and I yeah. recognize the the vendor names. So thank you. That's great. Uh, did anybody have questions about any of the clubs or anything else? No. Okay. Uh, new business. No. Okay. Uh, still seeing no members of the public have joined us. Jackie, have we gotten any emails in? Okay. Well then, look at that. We managed to finish early. Congratulations, team. That's one. <laughs> um, and I believe our meeting for September is tentatively scheduled for September 20th. That's a Tuesday evening. Um, but always check the school district website. And with that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you.